Easter has come and gone. I wonder for you and I if it's just a tick in our calendar or just a reminder how quickly 2024 is rushing by. I just want us to pause for a moment as I lead us in prayer after Easter. Ultimately, our Lord was crucified and he rose again. Perhaps we need to be reminded of that reality for therein lies our faith in Jesus Christ. I'd like to share a prayer written by Erin Klein. O oh God of the Last Supper, God of the cross, and God of the empty tomb, we come before you now and we pause. We inhale the scent of snow-white Easter lilies. We see the rain as it falls in veils and sheets of April showers. And we listen. Holy Week has passed, but how we long to live by the marvelous story we have heard. Let us remain ever beside you at the table of the Last Supper. Show us who is hungry and give us the courage to offer them bread from your table. Show us who is thirsty and give us the strength to lift up the cup of your love. Most of all, show us how to linger at your table serving others, doing all that we do in remembrance of you and the way you were when you walked this earth. We lift this simple, yet limited words up to you, O Lord, our God. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the book of Matthew, 17 verses 1 to 13, the transfiguration. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said, to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come and he will restore all things. But I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. So also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. 
Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. So far from the word of God. Well, clearly we're back in Matthew and you likely have so many questions right now. Granted, some of you are hearing this little story for the first time and still processing it. Uh, but for those who read ahead, which you can do with the personal study guides, for those who read ahead, you must be wondering a few things like me. Firstly, why the hike up a high mountain? Did these guys need some exercise? Why only Peter, James and John? of all the 12 disciples. I mean, it's the so-called inner circle, but of all the 12 guys to pick from, I mean, James and John, the guy who you know, just had their mom come ask Jesus, can they sit on the left and right? And Peter, who was still removing the taste of foot out of his mouth, why these three guys? What does transfigured mean? That sounds like something out of the sci-fi movie, right? And the scene that unfolds with Jesus radiating kind of fits with that genre as well. Where on earth did Moses and Elijah come from? Have those guys not been dead for a long time? How did they recognize Moses and Elijah? Have you ever thought about that, those who've you know, seen the story? How did they recognize them? It was like, I just imagine Peter standing there and he's like, hang on. Is he used that? Is, could, that? could that be? No. I mean, it's not like they had photos. It's not like he like reaches into his pocket, pulls out his phone. Could it be Facebook? Moses, 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 Moses. Yes, it's, it's him. Like, how do they recognize Moses and Elijah? And what on earth was going through Peter's mind when he suggests an impromptu camping trip as a result of this moment? And then we have a bright cloud with a voice booming out of it and then followed by a cryptic discussion about whether Elijah is gonna come back from the dead. Suffice to say, there's a lot going on here. This is a significant and central story unit in Matthew, where Matthew is tying together some of the major movements he's been making about the revelation about Jesus. Doing a, he's bringing a lot together in this one little scene. So here's how we're gonna handle this passage for today. With all of the questions at every point in the story, I think it's best for today to work through it just line by line from start to finish, and then maybe have a look at some relevance for us today at the end. Sound good? Here we go, we're gonna go through it line by line, we'll break it into three parts. So first part being the actual transfiguration event, then the reaction to it, Peter's reaction, God's reaction to Peter, the disciples' reaction to God's reaction to Peter. So reactions, and then the descent out of the mountain. So let's go. Number one, let's have a look at this transfiguration moment in verses one to three. So reading verse one again. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. So by now, having heard the whole reading and having seen Moses pop up, the reference to Ha Mountain would likely be reminding those of you more familiar with the Old Testament, reminding you of Mount Sinai in the Old Testament in the moment of God covenanting with his people after he had brought them out of Egypt. If that's in your mind, that's exactly what should be in your mind as there are numerous similarities between that moment in Mount Sinai and Moses and what's happening before us. So let me take you back. Let's have a quick look at that moment on Mount Sinai, Exodus 24, reading from verse 15. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelled on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. Start noticing some similarities. On the seventh day, he called Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud, went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. So notice the similarities. 
Number one, the mountain. Always a place in the Bible of revelation where God, when He calls someone up on a mountain, there's going to be a revealing of God to them. Notice the six-day reference. Did you pick that up? After so the cloud comes on the mountain in Exodus, and after six days, God calls Moses up the mountain. In Matthew, notice that after the events of chapter 16, you know, you pick up your cross and follow me, Matthew gives a time stamp. Six days later comes this event. Matthew doesn't often give time stamps. He's very interested in geography. So when he does, there must be a reason. So six days, Moses, now six days, the story. And in Scripture, whenever you have a particular reference to six days, know that a holy moment's coming on the seventh day. So six days, Moses, and then this transfiguration event. Notice also the cloud, couldn't miss that. A reminder of the presence of God with Israel through their wanderings in the desert. Notice also the voice out of the cloud, the voice speaking to Moses out of the cloud and the voice speaking at the transfiguration moment as well. Also notice, uh, it wasn't in the, the reading we did, but in the story of Moses and Mount Sinai, Moses went up and there were three witnesses Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, three witnesses, and going up on the mountain with Jesus are three people, Peter, James, and John. And maybe one of the reasons it's James and John is because we read, I mean, Matthew drew attention to the fact that we're brothers. Well, Aaron, his two sons, Nadab and Abihu, were brothers, and so maybe this is deliberately pointing our attention that way. Also, if you're familiar with the rest of the Exodus story, you'll know that when Moses came down from the mountain after having visited with God, his appearance changed. Remember that? Now, he was radiating. His face was shining. I mean, let me just read it to you. Exodus 34, verse 29. Then when Moses came down, so after the 40 days, 40 nights, he came down with the two tablets of the testimony, the Ten Commandments in his hand. Moses didn't know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Remember, he had to put a veil over his face because over his face, all the Israelites are like, man, he's shining so bright, we can't see. So notice the similarity of faces radiating. There were two things about Jesus' appearance at the transfiguration, his face radiating and his clothes shining, which is perhaps a throwback to Psalm 104, which we had in a call to worship. Difference though, with Moses, his face is reflecting the glory of God that he had witnessed. But with Jesus, it's not a reflection, it's a radiation. It's the glory that's inside of him already, which is what we learn from the next verse. Verse two, and he, Jesus, was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Now, transfigured is a word you, I think you'll only find in the Bible, but it's actually a translation of an ordinary word that in ordinary English we would say transformed. Ordinarily, we just say transformed. But transfigured is better than transformed because transformed means your form has changed. But Jesus' form has not changed. He has not changed from a man into a dove, for instance, although that would probably be quite spectacular. That's not what's happening here. His form isn't technically changing, but something drastic has changed about his nature. Even then, that's not correct because it's been there what his nature isn't changed either. What we are seeing in the transfiguration is something that has been there all along. This is a temporary unveiling of the divinity of Jesus, the Son of God. Remember the story when the eternal Son of God, second member of the Trinity, took on flesh, that's the Christmas story, and became the man Jesus. His divine nature was obscured to us. We did not see him in the fullness of his glory while he was walked the earth in human form. So what we're seeing in the transfiguration is a temporary uncovering of the intrinsic glory because of him being the divine, eternal Son of God. I heard one pastor refer to Jesus before the transfiguration as God incognito. I don't know, I don't mean like that browser mode that you're not supposed to use because it normally means you're going to sites that you shouldn't go to, but incognito means one's identity concealed. And so Jesus' true identity as the divine God, his nature, has been concealed in his 
humanity and it's now revealed for a moment. But even that's not entirely true because it's not like his divine nature has been concealed. Why? Because we've seen him do miracles, like amazing miracles, calming of storms, multiplying of food, raising people from the dead, even forgiving sins. So it's not like it's been concealed, but now for a moment, for an instant, for like, I don't know, a few minutes, the disciples are allowed to see Jesus Christ in the fullness of his glorious nature. And what we're seeing through their eyes, through the story, what we're seeing is visually and unmistakably what we've heard before in the story, that Jesus is God's son. Equal, therefore, in nature with God, as a son is equal in nature to his father, but different in relationship as father to son. That's right, y'all. This is the Trinity on display here. It's all happening today. How fun, aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Now I told you all, there's a lot going on here. So this, so for the disciples, this moment, it's accomplishing a few things. So firstly, it's a verification for the disciples, a verification for the disciples of the true identity of Jesus. And they need that because he's just told them, this was, I mean, two weeks ago when we were last in Matthew, he's just told them that he's going to suffer and die. And they are struggling to wrap their heads around it. And so this temporary revelation that he's the divine son of God, again, reinforces the fact that it's his divine purpose that he will die, not a mistake. As he's been trying to tell them, it's his purpose. And this is just a a verification, hey, it's his purpose to die. But it's not just this little story. It's not just to fortify them in the moments when Jesus would die. It also is to prepare them and prepare us for what is yet to come, something still in the future. This is where we really need to dig deep this morning. If you're thinking, man, it's been like it's what we've been doing so far. That was just a shallow end. So let's go back to verse 28 of chapter 16. So technically in the passage that Zwei preached on uh, a few weeks ago, but it belongs here connected to this passage. So let's, let's go there. That's after Jesus speaks about his coming death. Remember, he very soberly warns the disciples, hey, you're gonna have to pick up your cross too. Like things are gonna get tough for you as well. But he, remember from my sermon, spoke so well about the fact that he, there's a reward for you when Jesus returns again. So that's where we're going back to. Let's have a look first. Let's rewind one verse further. Verse 27, chapter 16. Jesus says, for the son of man. So after speaking about how you're gonna, you're gonna suffer. The son of man is gonna come with his angels in the glory of his father, fully in the glory, no more obscuring of that. And then he will repay slash reward every person according to what he has done. Remember that? Speaking about a future coming in glory. Then verse 28, Jesus says this, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. Now, I don't know if two weeks ago, when I preached on that, that if you got confused, because really you should be. Because Jesus, verse 27, clearly talking about he will come in his glory with angels. Has that event happened? As far as I can tell, unless I missed something substantial, that event has not happened. So he's speaking about his future return, but then he said that some of the guys standing there, his 12 disciples, wouldn't taste death until that event happened. And those guys are long dead, right? So was Jesus lying? Did he have it, did he have it wrong? Or was he referring to another event that some of them, he says some of you will not taste death, that some of them will witness that is like the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Perhaps a preview of the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Yes, is that option. That's the one. He's not wrong. He was not lying. What Jesus was referring to in verse 28, like literally the verse before, 
our transfiguration passage is the transfiguration event. Some of you will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What he's speaking about would be fulfilled six days later. And the point of it is this, just in case he had just reminded his disciples, you'll suffer, but don't worry, reward is coming when I return. And in case they had any doubt that he, Jesus, would return in glory, he goes, let me give you a sneak preview of what my glorious coming, of what it's like when I come again. In other words, Peter, James, and John are seeing Jesus then as we will all see him one day. To bring us all together, the transfiguration is therefore not just a temporary unveiling of the majesty of Jesus as Son of God, it is, but it is also a foreshadowing, a preview, if you like, of his future coming in his kingdom. That's what he meant in verse 28. Again, I, I told you, this little story unit, Matthew is drawing so many themes together of what he's trying to show us about Jesus in this one little story. Are you seeing how that's true? Huge, huge strands of the biblical story are coming together on this high mountain, which is why in the next verse, all of a sudden, hey, it's Moses and Elijah. Let's deal with that question. Why Moses and Elijah? And by the way, we're doing great. We're knocking off a lot of questions, aren't we, this morning? Like why the high mountain? Why Peter, James, and John? What transfigured means? We're getting there. Now, what on earth are Moses and Elijah doing here? Quite a few reasons why they're here. Firstly, on a simple level, both Moses and Elijah also had mountaintop experiences. So Moses on Mount Sinai, Elijah's story of meeting God on a mountain, Horeb's the same mountain as Mount Sinai. So there's that in common, but on a deeper level, it's likely that Moses here represents the, the Torah, or the, the law. Remember, even Jesus refers to the scriptures in, in twofold as the law and the prophets. And the law is the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Moses is the key person representing those five books of the Bible. And Elijah, as a prophet, and his story is told in the prophetic writings, represents the prophets. And so what you have visually is you've got Jesus, and in the, from thinking from a biblical point of view, you've got the law and the prophets and Jesus. In other words, going back to Matthew 5, that really important statement he made at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, do not think I've come to abolish the law, Moses representing, or the prophets, Elijah representing, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. What you're seeing visually is all of Scripture coming together in Jesus in a picture. How cool, but that's not all. On a deeper level is the fact that both Moses and Elijah were really important messianic forerunners. In other words, they had a unique purpose beyond just the roles that they had to do, substantial roles, but they had a unique purpose when it came to preparing the way for the Messiah. Elijah, we've spoken about before, but let's go to Moses. What messianic purpose did Moses have? Well, there's a little known but really important prophecy regarding Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Like this is something we never talk about when we talk about messianic predictions, but now's, now's the time. So just listen with me, Deuteronomy 18. Moses speaking makes this prophecy. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Is that ringing a bell? It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb, Sinai, on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. The people were so afraid, only Moses got to go up. And the Lord said to me, Moses, they are right in what they've spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, a human type of prophet. And I will put words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And going back, you shall listen to him. So here Moses says, another one will come like me. Like who? Like Moses, a prophet, but 
prophet like Moses. We don't often think of Moses as a prophet because what do we think of Moses as primarily? A deliverer. So a prophet slash deliverer. There's one who will come like me in that office of yes, prophet, but also deliverer. And you must listen to him. And now comes the voice out of the cloud. Here's that guy. Listen to him. And if you think I'm making vague connections here, I know you don't think that, but I want to tell you this. Anyway, Peter, who's there, he makes the connection between Deuteronomy 18 and what's happening before him because he writes, in, well, he write, in Acts chapter 3, in his first sermon to the Jewish people at Solomon's portico, you can go and read that in Acts chapter 3. He quotes Deuteronomy 18. He goes, I saw that. So that's Moses as a messianic forerunner. This is in view. And Elijah, as we learned back in Matthew chapter 11, I wish we had time to go into this deeper today, but we don't. Malachi 4 is the great, the, literally in the last few verses before you get to the New Testament, the prediction that Elijah will come again before the day of the Lord, the day when God wraps everything up. And we learned and we saw today how that was fulfilled somewhat in John the Baptist question remains, will Elijah come again? That's a story for another day. But all to say, these two guys, Moses and Elijah, messianic markers. When you see them, you're going, oh, the Messiah's near. Oh, wait, must be that other guy, Jesus. Absolutely. That's the transfiguration. Now, what about the reactions to it? If that happens, and then there's all these reactions. First person to react, to say something, is Peter. I love Peter. He's always the first to jump in there. Who suggests we put up some tents for the guys to stay in? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm all for a camping trip. But even this is like a spontaneous camping trip to the point of which I don't know if I would be prepared for. What is going through Peter's mind in suggesting, if you wish, I'll put up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And to be honest, we have no idea. We have no idea why Peter suggested this. We can only speculate. At best, at best, Peter had the Feast of Booths in mind. One of the six slash seven major festivals we celebrated. One of them on Easter Thursday, the Passover. Another one is this Feast of Booths where Israel commemorated their wandering in the deserts where they lived in tents. And so this festival, Feast of Booths, people would live in tents. What fun. I say we redo that festival as well. So at best, Peter has that in mind, this feast, which would be coming up shortly. I mean, what do you think? You think Peter's thinking that? I mean, who knows? Maybe. But at worst, and it's actually not that bad, but at, on the other end of the spectrum, Peter just imagined these guys are going to be around for a while. They need a place to stay. He's being hospitable. Lord, it's good that we're here. This is awesome. Moses, Elijah, I have so many questions. Let's hang out for a little bit. Like seriously, maybe it's, it's a desire that this moment not be lost. Let's stay, let's dwell here. Who knows why Peter makes this suggestion about erecting three tents for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. It doesn't matter because God pretty quickly interrupts and says, hey, Peter, Tula, Tula, Wena. Enough, like, stop talking. And he doesn't quite say that, but this voice booms from the cloud and says, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. That first part, the first sentence, is verbatim. What the voice from heaven said at another critical moment in Jesus' life, which was his baptism. Matthew chapter three, the voice rang from heaven, no cloud that day, but a voice comes from heaven. This is my beloved son. And so as, as if it wasn't enough that we see visually, this is God's son because of the transfiguration, because of the glory that is inside of him. If it's not enough that you see it, you hear it as well. This is my beloved son. But the addition here, so it's verbatim chapter three, but the addition is listen to him, which has echoes to Deuteronomy 18, as we've already seen, but there's more. The lion, listen to him, 
is at the literary center of the story. If you've got a Bible with you, open it. Just have a look at like this little story, verse 1 to 13. It's, it should be separated in its own paragraph. And the line, listen to him, should be in the middle of that paragraph. I mean, it is in the middle in the original language. And you know Matthew. We love Matthew. He, he puts things in the middle in order for us to focus on them. Listen to him. So here's what's going on. We don't know why Peter made that suggestion, but we do know it was a bad, a bad suggestion because of God's interruption. But whatever Peter's motivation, what he was doing, why it was a bad idea, is he was putting these three men on an equal level. So Peter sees these two great Old Testament heroes. It doesn't really get greater unless you're David, right? So he sees these great Old Testament guys and goes, oh, hey, and, and Jesus. He sees them and he wants to honor them. So he's, he may be showing respect to Jesus. Hey, you're great. Like Moses is great. Like Elijah is great. But what the voice from heaven says very clearly is that while Moses and Elijah are important figures in God's redemptive story, they're not his son. There's only one that is the Son of God, and that is Jesus. And so Peter's suggestion here, whatever his motivation, blurs the uniqueness of Jesus as God's Son. He is treating him as Moses and Elijah. In other words, he is damning Jesus with faint praise, as the saying goes. You with me? This interruption, this voice from heaven, that's what Peter's suggestion, that's what's happening here. Jesus alone is God's beloved son and he alone must be listened to and obeyed. As we were reminded earlier, he alone is God's son, alone be listened to. That doesn't mean throw out what Moses said. You can go back and listen to sermon on chapter five for more on that, but we've already, we've already seen that Jesus is the fulfillment of what Moses says, the ultimate interpreter of everything Moses and everything about Elijah. Listen therefore to him, narrow your focus to him and him alone. And that word alone is emphasized at the end of the transfiguration story part, alone. So after they fall on their faces afraid, Jesus comes, touches them, raises them up and we, we read this. So when they get up, when they lift up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. It's the last word in the original text. It should be in the translation. It almost always is for emphasis. Jesus only. In other words, there's a lot to say, as we've said, about the presence of Moses and Elijah, but perhaps what's more important then why Moses and Elijah are there and their presence and what they're talking about, what's more important to think on is their absence at the end and the only one that remains is Jesus. Now attention's drawn there. They're gone. It's Jesus alone and listen to him alone. Before the disciples, they must not lose their focus on Jesus, especially as the journey turns towards Jerusalem. Third part of the story, the descent down the mountain. I'm not gonna spend any time on this, I wish I could. Mainly because I wanna leave that middle part, I wanna make sure that's what's staying uppermost in your mind. What is worth pointing out though, is Jesus telling his disciples on the way down, hey, don't tell anyone about this until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So when the Son of Man is raised from the dead, then go nuts, tell people about the transfiguration story, which is why this is a great post-Easter passage because we just reflected on the Son of Man being raised from the dead. Why did Jesus say, don't tell them? Because the story of the transfiguration, there is the chance that this vision will tempt people to disregard the fact that he will suffer and die. Something like, hey, no, it can't be. He won't suffer and die. Look, we saw, like, this is God. So don't, so don't tell them yet, but after his death and after his vindication through resurrection, go nuts, tell people about what you saw on that mountain, the majesty of Messiah Jesus. Tell people and, let, and remind them that that's what he'll look like when he comes again in his kingdom fully. 
That's the story. That's as much as I can say today. I want to reflect a little bit. A lot to reflect on the story for our lives. Here's just three quick thoughts from me. Number one, I think is to see him. To see him for us today. So it's not a coincidence that this revelation happens just after Jesus tells the disciples things are going to get tough. Things are going to get tough. You'll suffer for my sake. And then, boom, this revelation, this vision. In other, they should keep this picture in their minds as they now live for Him, follow Him, testify about Him, and as things get crazy, they should keep drawing their minds back to this vision of Jesus the glorious. And so we should have that same this same revelation. I mean, we haven't had the transfiguration like the disciples do, but that's why we sing songs about the Son of God and His glory and why we remind ourselves from the Scriptures and God by His Holy Spirit does shine into our hearts, giving the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ for a reason. We need it to remind ourselves when things get difficult. This is the God we're serving. This is the one we're following. Yes, He's the Messiah who suffered and died, but He's also the divine Son of God. That's who we worship. That's who we're serving. So let's keep that in view. So let's see Him, number two. Let's listen to Him. Of course, I had to go there. Listen to Him. It's at the center of the story. Of course, the idea is not just like here, but here and obey. Like, listen and incorporate into your life. And we know this, but just again, a reminder, at the end of the epic Sermon on the Mount where Jesus was speaking, we were listening, at the end of that Sermon on the Mount, he gave that last little parable about the house on the rock. The one who builds his house on the rock, who survives when the wind and rain comes, is the one who hears and does what I say. He means that. Like, listen to me and do, do I mean, honestly, if you're a new Christian here, this is the first step forward in the Christian life. Listen and do what Jesus says. And I've got to tell you, it's also every step thereafter for everybody else. Listen to Jesus. And seriously, I know this sounds like a little abstract, but seriously, with all the voices competing for our attention, Listen to Jesus. And I mean, especially the voices, the ones that we're turning to, listening to for guidance, for encouragement, for some source of hope because things are tough, or to, to grow, to get better in some way, for all the, all the voices competing for our attention on those levels. Narrow it down and listen to Jesus. I mean, by all means, if you want guidance in your life on how to be a better athlete or how to make better sourdough bread, not sure why I chose those two examples, then by all means, listen to podcasts and watch YouTube videos. But when it comes to your life and the need for wisdom and encouragement and a source of hope and how to grow, make it the voice of Jesus. Amen? And many voices operating on all of those levels, some of them good most of them horrible. And this, this vision, this revelation with this at the middle of it, listen to him, is supposed to narrow our focus like the disciples to Jesus and his words and ultimately his authority. That's really what we're getting at here. It's a matter of authority. Like where Peter puts Jesus on an equal level to Moses and Elijah, and they disappear, may God by His Spirit today, if there are people or voices or things competing on an equal level in authority to Jesus, may by His Holy Spirit He make them disappear and we see Jesus only. And then lastly, number three, love Him. So see Him, follow Him, love Him. And I was just thinking, we were singing that song before the sermon and it says similar things. It says follow Him, love Him. What was the other one? Adore. Anyway, here's my three. So ending with love him. You, why love? Well, you can't miss. And we often do miss. I've missed. I mean, you've been a Christian for a while. You've heard the story many times. 
And often we miss just the simple father-son moment here. I mean, it's the Trinity, so it's like, whoa, how do we get his wife? But it's a father-son moment here. This is my beloved son. And amidst all the theology and it's all there and it's glorious, don't miss the affection between the Father and the Son in the Trinity. Whatever you make of God and Trinity, don't miss the love that exists there and by extension to us. What I mean. I'll close by reading this verse, 1 John 4. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, that's what this story is about, us seeing that. Whoever confesses, acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. It's like we're invited into this trinity, this, at least not as gods, but to experience the love that's there. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. Are you getting this love and abiding? And here's the implications. By this is love perfected with us so we, we may have confidence for the day of judgment. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. So maybe that's a good thing to end on. This picture of this divine love that we are invited into. It's not just for father and son exclusively invited into for those who have this revelation, this acknowledgement that Jesus is the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, this morning, as we reflect a little bit on this story, so much going on, so much I've, I realize I've crammed into this short space of time. May we be left with what you mean for us to be left with. May you open the eyes of our heart, as it were, and our minds and reorient our world views to see clearly, as the disciples saw clearly, to see clearly Jesus the Christ, the one born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, ministered in Galilee, died a death on a Roman cross in Jerusalem, is the eternal Son of God. May we see that. May we see that amidst the competing voices and worldviews and thoughts. May that all fade away and it literally be Jesus alone in our minds and hearts. I pray for that today, Lord. And as He, your Son, remains, and as we rightly bow before Him, and assert ourselves to listen to him, to listen and do, to follow, to follow and to love and to be loved. May that be us today in a new, fresh way, I pray in the name of Jesus, your Son.